Welcome all, welcome everyone. This is Dr. Sharad Jaitley. I'm on moneymeterhealth.com, your favorite website, which is dedicated to teaching you about the human heart and its illnesses across the two channels that we feature on. One is Facebook, the other is YouTube. Thank you for watching moneymeterhealth.com. As I said, we are in extremely extremely happy and uh, for your enthusiastic support and tremendous uh, curiosity that you've shown thus far both from the medical fraternity as well as from the general community i really really appreciate this for watching moneymeterhealth.com and coming in large numbers and associating with our website thank you again without any further ado i'd like to delve on the subject of the matter and the matter of the subject being today uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it's called HCM as we call it and uh, essentially we are looking at uh, numerous acronyms one is IHSS which is idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis it's also known as ASH which is asymmetrical septal hypertrophy and then it's also known as muscular subaortic stenosis so, uh, or, uh, yes, so IHSS, ASH, and MSS, or they're all synonyms with the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, just so that you know. Now, interestingly enough, the incidence is roughly about 1 in 500. That makes it about uh, 2 in 1,000, which is about 0.2% in the general population, if you will. So it is fairly, you know, it's not un totally uncommon, but it's there. And it's not totally unrare, but uh, the very fact is it is uh, ex uh, existing in the population to the tune of 0.2%. Now, uh, it is genetic, obviously, and it's a genetic mutation that occurs uh, from a protein which is within the uh, sarcomere. And so it's a sarcomere protein that actually uh, mutates. And as a result, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy Develops. Now, what do we understand from this? So let's try to understand that first. Uh, essentially, what it looks like is, uh, let's put it this way. This is uh, our cartoon of the heart, which we always draw. Here's your right ventricle, the right atrium on the top. This is your left atrium, and I'm drawing the left ventricle now like this. So tricuspid valve quickly, and then, of course, you have your pulmonary artery. So the right side is totally intact. The septum is right here, so this is where the idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis occurs. As the name goes as, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. Why asymmetrical? Because the left ventricle tends to hypertrophy a little bit, but not, it's not, you see how it's asymmetrical? That's how it is. Now the mitral valve tends to impinge each time when it opens into the outflow tract, because remember the outflow tract is somewhere here. And because the outflow tract is right here, the mitral valve will constantly impinge on it. So just to let you know, it's an interesting pathophysiology that results from this septal hypertrophy I'm showing in these arrows. The thickness is normally about uh, 1.3 to 1 ratio between uh, the septal wall and the, free, and the free wall, which is the lateral wall. Um, Another criteria to diagnose this is where you have, uh, if you were to look at the left ventricle, the left ventricle will look more like this. So this is your right ventricle, for instance, like a D shape, and you have a right, uh, left ventricle here. The right ventricle, let me just draw it here for you guys. Okay, and uh, so the left ventricle tends to have the septal hypertrophy. It tends to bulge uh, within the ventricle here within the left ventricle. So this being the LV, this is your RV here. Um, another uh, aspect that I'd like to mention here is clearly um, there is left ventricular diastolic dysfunction as a result because uh, there is tend to be a relaxation problem within the ventricle. It doesn't relax fully. So that's or it relaxes slowly enough. So the filling is delayed. So these are some of the criteria uh, to look at. So essentially what you look at is one, there is an LV mass will be increased. So by definition, the LV mass will be increased because of the hypertrophy. Next thing is LV cavity itself will be also uh, dilated, but not to the extent that the diastolic function, uh, the diastolic dimension will still be less than 45 millimeters. LV diastolic dimension is still less than 45 millimeters. 
and three, you'll have LVH, which is approximately 30 millimeters, if you will. So there'll be a severe form of LVH, left ventricle hypertrophy, as seen in these individuals. Now, having defined these features, uh, how, how is it distinguishing uh, from the, how does it compare and contrast with the athlete's heart? Now, athletes heart, a lot of the athletes have uh, very massive hearts, so they will have an LV mass, so that will be present in the athlete's heart, okay? Uh, it looks like pretty much, very much uh, like a variance of IHSS, but there are certain criteria which will definitely define that that's pathophysiological. It's okay to have an athlete's heart because he's highly, or the person is highly conditioned to run or to lift weights or what have you, whatever the athlete is performing in this activity. LV diastolic dimensions here will be more than 55 millimeters. Remember, the LV cavity will be large, and the LVH will not be so massive like 30 millimeters. It will be less. The LVH will be less than 30. So that's one of the criteria for athlete's heart. And then diagnostically, of course, if you were to look at, there will be genetic uh, uh, um, uh, dyssynchrony, if you will, microscopic dyssynchrony, and you can do a genetic uh, chromosomal study and you will see uh, what we were just talking about, uh, how the uh, mutation of the, of the sarcomere that will be present here and one can do a genetic chromosomal study and that will be present in the, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and not present in the athlete's heart. Having defined all of this, now let's go beyond uh, further up and try and see what we can uh, elicit. Uh, we can elicit now the natural history. Now, the natural history of Hokum is the following. Uh, most of these patients, they start with early heart failure, later on progress to severe heart failure. Other patients will start to have symptoms of syncope. There'll be other patients who will have atrial fibrillation. Uh, natural history will define that these, prog these patients can progress and eventually can even have an episode of sudden cardiac death. Uh, if they survive, then obviously they may have multiple episodes of sudden cardiac death as well, and that has been defined. But most of these patients, they get an ICD placement because once a sudden cardiac death episode is uh, elicited by in the family history or in the patient, uh, uh, patient itself, uh, that makes it a high-risk patient, obviously. Other arrhythmias may be present as well just so that you know. And what are the other arrhythmias? The VTs and the VFs. And uh, a lot of VPCs can occur, SVTs can occur, all sorts of arrhythmias can occur. But a non-sustained VT is a very, very uh, high risk. Now, what makes it a high risk? Uh, um, let's understand what is a high risk uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this individual. Now, uh, one, obviously you need to see syncope in these individuals. If you see syncope, uh, uh, hypotension, for instance, especially during uh, the time when somebody's doing a cardiovascular stress test, hypotension, if you suggest that like a, the blood pressure attenuation or, or drop in blood pressure during the time of the exercise, syncope, especially during exertion, remember that. Okay, so these are the two or three symptoms. Um, <clears throat> family history. Now, family history will be very remarkable for sudden cardiac death will also be remarkable for syncope. So uh, an early sudden cardiac death, especially 30, 40 year old uh, uh, individuals in the family dying of, uh, or, known, or knowingly dying of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that person who comes in to get evaluated and has a, heart, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a high risk. Remember that, so family history is very, very important. Uh, on an echo, of course, there are certain features which are very, very high risk. One is uh, 30 millimeters of your LVH. If you see that in the septal wall, that is a high risk. More than 30 millimeters of your pressure gradient. Now, between the subaortic uh, pressure gradient, we call it. So, subaortic pressure gradient, if it is more than 30 millimeters, that makes it a very, very high uh, risk. And then LV aneurysms have been also defined in these individuals. Uh, so, there are two or three criteria. One is the left ventricular hypertrophy of a massive nature, subaortic uh, pressure gradient of more than 30 millimeters and LV angio, uh, aneurysm, which can be listed in an echo. Holters will define also the high-risk nature of this individual of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by demonstrating that there are repeated episodes of non-sustained BTs, and that, makes, that, that brings you again to the high-risk group. 
So now, how do you, how do you, what do you do with these high-risk group patients? So obviously, you want to do beyond uh, the following. So normally, say if somebody presents with heart failure, you treat that patient with afterload reduction. Okay. Then there are diuretics. You can use the diuretics, obviously, to unload the heart. But very be cautious because the ventricle is rather hyperdynamic. It's very small. You don't want to over diurese these patients. So just make sure they just get to uvolemic and shut off the diuretics immediately. Um, you could use beta blockers, obviously. They are negatively chronotropic and negatively inotropic. So as a result, the ventricle tends to be bigger because that's the problem. You have a hyperdynamic LV, like I showed you earlier, on the on the on the on the on my schematic. Now here is an echo, for instance. Uh, this is a long axis view. This is the aorta right here, and uh, if you will, uh, this becomes your septum, and that is I'm drawing it like a schematic here, obviously. And then you have a mitral valve which impinges onto the septum right like that, and there is another mitral valve right here. And uh, you have your left atrium going up like that, and this is your left ventricle free wall. So what is happening is you have your septal wall right here, if you will, and the mitral valve is here. These are so th you will elicit a SAM in the echo, which is systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet, and then the septal hypertrophy, which is uh, septal wall, is more than 30 millimeters, if you will, and that makes it a very very high risk. The left ventricle cavity is 45 millimeters or less, and as a result, it could be a very, very problematic, especially if you are using a lot of diuretics. Beta blockers, what they do is they keep the ventricular volume large. One, by lowering the heart rate, and two, by the negative chronotropy and inotropy. So as a result, the ventricle tends to relax more. Um, atrial fibrillation, how is that managed? Well, that's managed by amiodarone. That's the drug of choice, and it's a wonderful drug because it's normally a, rate, a rhythm control drug and normally converts patient into a normal sinus rhythm. One can also do cardioversion here and treat those patients with cardioversion. Uh, the other treatments for atrial fibrillation in, in terms of drugs, obviously one can use beta blockers. You could use uh, verapamil. Verapamil is a great drug because it's a negatively anotropic drug, markedly negatively anotropic drug, even beyond the beta blockers. And then you have disopyramide. That's a very old drug, by the way. I've used it for over 30 years. And it's an excellent drug in this setting. One, because it's not proarrhythmic, so it's a wonderful drug. If there are no arrhythmias in the holter, you don't want to give any more holters to this individual, disopyramide becomes a great choice. Even if the holter has some arrhythmias, disopyramide is good because it does not proarrhythmically act on the, on, the, on the musculature here. Now, ablation is the other choice. One can do ablation as well. And uh, ablation followed by a maze procedure, if you will. And you could do that. And then, of course, cardioversion is the other thing. But make sure all these patients are well anticoagulated because that's one of the things that uh, we run into problems with. So anticoagulation is essential for all atrial fibrillations. So what do we have so far? Ablation, uh, maze procedure, anticoagulation, beta blockers, verapamil, and disopyramide in, those ch in, in that order, and the amiodron to control the atrial fibrillation uh, in these settings. Remember, there is a systolic anterior mo uh, motion um, uh, of the mitral valve leaflet. That is a diagnostic criteria. Septal wall is more than 30 millimeters. LV diastolic di uh, dysfunction will be present, obviously. And then you have uh, sometimes an LV aneurysm may be present here as well, where the LV tends to dilate. So these are some of the features, echocardiographic features of the patient. Now, coming to, uh, so besides heart failure, atrial fibrillation, uh, syncope. How do you manage syncope in these patients? Syncope can be managed by, well, first of all, find out if it's any, if, if it's any of the arrhythmias that's doing it. And obviously, the patient needs an ICD. If you have a lot of uh, VTs and VFs on Holter, you're better off because syncope is a very, very high-risk patient. Uh, in terms of hyp uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you're better off using uh, an ICD placement there and avert all these uh, VTs and syncope-like epi syncope episodes. Uh, if sudden cardiac death, as I said, is a, is a, is a remarkable uh, natural his uh, history feature, and one that has to be addressed by ICD. No need to do any EP anymore because sudden cardiac death itself signifies that, look, it's, uh, you know, you've already had a, had a near a near death episode, so an ICD placement is the is the procedure of choice there. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, try to manage the heart failure atrial fibrillation accordingly, in addition to the ICD placement in these individuals. Now, uh, sometimes you have obstructive patterns. What are the obstructive patterns as part of the natural history? The obstructive history will define that these patients have very low cardiac output. They could be very um, more prone for syncope, and uh, they have uh, high pressure gradients. So obstructive patterns will have to be treated uh, by surgical myomectomy, specifically so if this is growing in size and on a six-monthly and on a yearly basis. This is really obstructing into the outflow tract here, and the blood is not flowing in, and it's a hyperdynamic because the left ventricle squeezes in, and more dyssynergy occurs in this section of the septum, and as a result, all of this can fall fall off. So the cardiac output will diminish and these patients are highly prone for syncope and sudden cardiac death. So the obstructive features can be managed by, surgic, by surgical myomectomies. They remove a portion of the, myom, uh, of the septal wall and it's called surgical myomectomy. Uh, another way to do it is by transiotic. They bring a catheter here and you can actually do a trans, transiotic or transvalvular, they call it, myomectomy. Another way to do it is by alcohol ablation. So alcohol is injected into one of those perforating ar uh, perforator arteries, rather we call it, alcohol uh, ablation of the septal wall, and that's by uh, injecting alcohol actually into the perfor one of the septal perforator arteries, and as a result, one can uh, cause microinfarcts, and uh, hopefully some of this thinning will occur, and this will, uh, uh, this will abate the obstructive symptoms. So in a nutshell, this was the... Um, uh, this was, these were the features and the natural history, the pathophysiology, the treatment plans, and what the presenting features for high-risk uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies are. Uh, hope you enjoyed my discussion on this. This is a, I know it's a very, very substantial subject where people can talk for hours, but I like to give you the most and the best, to which is uh, right now uh, possibly very helpful for your exam taking, especially for the cardiology boards, internal medicine boards as well as for your uh, uh, medical school boards. So I strongly recommend that follow my moneymeterhealth.com for such uh, uh, vignettes, uh, primarily to uh, upgrade your knowledge. And of course, to my cardiology colleagues, if they, if they come across these patients, I think it's a good brush up to really um, you know, follow my videos uh, in, in a quick fashion so they can, um, they can brush up their skills even further before they go and see the patient again. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for watching MoneyMeterHealth.com. This is Dr. Jaitley. So long. Until next.